And first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you our work in uh, trying to build the guidelines for s -wormatosis. I would like to show you where our hospital is located. It's in the northeast of Barcelona. The hospital is called German Stries Pujol. It's in the top of a mountain. It's difficult to reach, but if sometimes you have the opportunity, you will find many health professionals that are, they are happy to work with uh, NF patients. As you know, as one hematosis is the most rare type of neurofibromatosis and affect less than one every 4,000 people. As one hematosis is an inherited syndrome characterized by the development of typically painful benign term, tumors that we call s -wanomas, on the spinal and peripheral nerves around the body. The most common symptom is chronic pain, which can occur anywhere in the body. Signs and symptoms of s -wanomatosis usually develop during adulthood years, but they can occur at any age. This disease affects all populations, genders, and ethnicity equally. This means every one of us can be uh, an s patient. So far, two genes located in chromosome 22 has been identified as responsible for s -wanomatosis. These genes are SMARB1 and l set of gr one As you can see, these are very close to the NF2 gene. Life expectancy is not usually reduced like the, the ways in NF2, but quality of life is strongly affected. Right now, there is no cure for s -wanomatosis, but we know that pain management has to be an integral part of care. Class asked me to talk about guidelines in s -wanomatosis. And the first thing that we have to realize is that if we look to the literature, there is no s -wanomatosis guidelines published yet. There is only one paper done by Garrett Evans that many of you will know and colleagues that deal with surveillance in pediatric neurofibromatosis to unrelated disorders. And then they talk about s -wanomatosis. Because of that, in the last past two years, the European Reference Network Genturis joined with also the European Patient Advocacy Group, we have been trying to build an ERNG in tourist clinical practice guideline for s -wanomatosis. It has been a work for two years dealing with uh, diagnosis, treatment, management, and surveillance of people. These practice guidelines will be released shortly and today, I want to share with you some of the agreements that has been reached during these two years. First, some general recommendations. We believe that care of patients with s -wanomatosis should be supervised by a multidisciplinary team. A time of diagnosis or possible uh, diagnosis all patients should be seen in a genetics department. Annual review should be undertaken by a recognized and a specialized specialist. Sorry. Patients, other local specialists and GPs should have telephone access to the, to the NF reference center 
for eswinomatosis related concerns. This means the knowledge has to be easy to reach. Talking about diagnosis, germline pathogenic variants in these two genes, SMARB1 and LCTR1, should be considered diagnosis of S1 nomatosis in the presence of someone with a proven S1 noma. This means that we have to have these two things together, an S1 noma and a genetic test or a family history. Where possible, analysis of two tumors should be performed in sporadic cases to confirm or refute mosaic NF2, because this is a confining diagnosis. Also, in some cases where this desmonomatosis has been diagnosed clinically, but we are not able to find the germline mutation in these two genes. And also there are no signs to genetic NF2, a special RNA testing should be considered. We have to roll out the bilateral vestibular esmonomas. It means we have to differentiate NF2 diagnosis from S1 nomatosis. And for that, baseline investigation should be performed with an MRI to this car, this, to rule out these bilateral vestibular esmonomas. Nowadays, we know the patients with LCTR1 can have unilateral vestibular resonance. Therefore, these tumors, unilateral vestibular esmonomas, should not be considered an exclusion criterion for the diagnosis of esmonomatosis. In our clinical guidelines, we have included genetic counseling and family uh, planning because we consider that it's very important to talk with patients at reproductive age about the likely risk of transmission to offspring. And also it's important to talk about the different options for testings in pregnancy and pre-implantation diagnosis. As you know, esmonomatosis is an autosomal disorder. And because of that, each of the child's has an almost a 50% chance to inherit the variant that causes the disease. However, we also know that in isolated cases with no these two genes, the transmission rate is less than 10%. Reduced penetrance in cases of LCTR1 also has to be discussed. Having the genetic variant doesn't mean that by sure you will have hesmonomas. Talking about surveillance, we recommend at least an annual clinical review. For tumor surveillance over screening, MRIs should be used. Nowadays, PET scan should not be used for diagnosis or surveillance of s that you should remember, there are benign tumors. A baseline assessment, including full craniospinal MRI, and or whole body MRI should be carried out on as soon after diagnosis, typically late childhood, 12 to 14 years, 
and should be repeated in early adulthood or if symptoms evolve. The frequency of repeating MRI should be determined by clinical judgments, guided by the presence of changing symptoms. We expect the routine repeat MRI are conducted at intervals of two to three years. We believe that more frequent MRI should not be conducted unless the person's symptoms change. Malignancy is thought to occur rarely in esglonomatosis. Recently, several cases have been described mainly in patients harboring germline mutations in a SMARB1 gene. Because of that, we recommend that a change in tumor in someone with a SMARB1 germline pathogenic variant should prompt exclusion of malignant transformation. And all kind of studies has to be performed in order to rule out this possibility. For targeted investigations of pain, ultrasounds in the hands of someone experienced may be useful problem solving modality. Nowadays, genetic tests are very common. And many patients, or many, many people, is found to carry an LCTR1 pathogenic variant. We consider the people with LCTR1 pathogenic variant detected incidentally with no personal history of s onomas and no pain or other s onoma symptoms should not undergo MRI imaging to detect s onomas as the risk are likely well below 1%. Remember that we have, have already said that in order to diagnose an s onomatosis we need to have the pathogenic variant, but also the presence of an s onoma or a family history. If, you, if, a, if a patient has no s onomas no family history, no symptoms, but one pathogenic variant, this patient has not, is not diagnosed of s onomatosis And how to manage patients with s onomatosis We have to remember that nowadays, we do not have a specific treatment for s onomatosis we have to, to well, I would say, to keep doing research in order to find a correct treatment. But nowadays, we will have to manage the symptoms. Multidisciplinary pain management, focusing on symptoms, targeting pain-related disability is needed. And we can use biopsychosocial approach. Remember that the main symptom in S1 homatosis is pain. We believe that chronic use of opioids is not recommended due to their poor effect on neuropathic pain and associate tolerance, dependency, and also hyperalexia. For those patients with painful s onomas if surgery is possible without neurological defect, then early surgical intervention should be offered. Surgery is useful to reduce pain. If surgery is performed, on symptomatic esvonomas, 
It should be performed by surgeons with experience. It's a delicate surgery. We recommend the use of interoperative neurophysiological monitoring. And this kind of monitor is essential for surgery in critical nerves. Using these devices, we can reduce side effects. If surgery fails to relieve local pain or symptoms, repeated surgery to the same symptomatic area should be avoided. Nowadays, the use of a spinal cord stimulation is an emerging therapeutic option and should be considered by multidisciplinary teams on an individual basis. Again, decisions of treatment should be taken by multidisciplinary teams. Radiotherapy is likely to increase the risk of malignant transformation of people with s -wanomatosis. We consider that radiotherapy should only be considered in growing s -wanomas that cannot be treated surgically or by other therapies. And in that way, bevacizumab probably should be actively considered along with all other treatment options in the multidisciplinary team review, specifically in patients with multiple, multiple rapidly enlarged tumors, which are symptomatic in terms of pain or neurological defense, and also in those which are inoperable. To conclude, esmonomatosis is an inherited syndrome characterized by the development of typically painful, benign nerve tumors on the spinal and peripheral nerves around the body. The most common symptom is chronic pain, which can occur anywhere in the body. Laser expectancy is not usually reduced, but quality of life is strongly affected. Patients should be managed by a specialized multidisciplinary team. The way that the doctor see the patient needs to be multiple. No longer only one doctor for an s patient. Pain management has to be an integral part of care. And remember, the frequency of repeat MRI should be determined by clinical judgments, guided by the presence of changing symptoms. If a patient if a tumor grows, if a patient has more pain, no matter an MRI has been performed this year, we have to repeat it. And I would like to conclude saying thanks to all my colleagues in the Spanish Reference Center for Phacomatosis, and also to all the patient associations that help us to perform and to do research in neurofibromatosis and esmonomatosis.